Um, I started telling you about details of vaccines last time, and I gave you the example of Edward Jenner, who used cowpox um, and then experimentally infected uh, people with smallpox. Um, that whole uh, process works because um, these two viruses are rather closely related. They share some antigens, which you can see here. Uh, the cowpox has the green thing and the blue triangle, um, as well as smallpox. They also have some unique antigens. And so when you make immune responses, here showing antibodies, it's in fact really both antibodies and T cells, um, you will get some cross-reactive responses. And so that was really the whole basis of that. Um, there are lots of things we now know that are probably not entirely true about the Jenner story that I gave you last time. Um, one of which is that, in fact, um, the virus he used was most likely horsepox and not cowpox. But same phenomenon works. <laughs> and while that may seem uh, like a very kind of old-timey thing, um, as I said, this experiment was done in 1796. Um, that exact procedure um, did lead to the eradication of uh, smallpox, leading to uh, the virus basically being gone from Earth except for two different laboratories. We'll knock on wood this time. Um, so um, this has been, of course, an incredibly impactful um, set of information. We can see similar types of impacts with many other different vaccines. Uh, on the left is a table from an earlier version of your textbook. On the right is the same thing in uh, picture form. So what you can see here are the number of cases per year of many of these different infectious diseases pre-vaccine and post-vaccine, as well as the percent reduction that we've seen as a result of the vaccine. And again, you can see that um, here. The thing in the syringe is the uh, cases at the beginning. Then we have the cases post-vaccine over here. So you can see that um, decrease. And so you can see this tremendous success of vaccines. Um, I'm going to um, go to a different slide because I'm just realizing that the current placement of it is um, not very smart. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. Uh, where is it? Hello? Just a second. Not this one, it's the other one. Okay. So this is basically showing you what we saw on that previous slide um, in another form. What you can see here are a bunch of different infectious diseases, and number of cases per year. These are cases per million. Note that this axis goes up to about 8,000 right now. And we can see the year in the top right corner. So we're going to start in 1912. Um, so you can see, for example, that with measles, there were 3,100 cases per million people um, in 1912. If a uh, disease is in pink, that means there's no vaccine. Um, if it's in green, that means that we're routinely vaccinating. 
for that infectious disease. And so I'm gonna hit play on this and you're gonna watch this go um, until 2018. I very much enjoy this video. Uh, and again, remember that we're about 8,000 um, on that axis at the bottom. So we can see uh, the big measles numbers throughout the 20s. You can see that some other infectious diseases are coming up as well, but measles is uh, also really causing a lot of issues. Um, we're in the 30s, in the 40s. Um, you know, our maximum numbers of cases are getting a little lower. So we've already changed our scale. We're in the 50s. And now we actually get to sort of the golden age of uh, making vaccines into the 60s. And so now, there goes measles, there goes mumps, there's chickenpox, which didn't have a vaccine for, a while, for uh, some time. So you can see chickenpox is so far above all the others. And there's a chickenpox vaccine. <laughs> And you can, again, remember we were at 8,000 <laughs> for our maximum um, on this scale when we started in 1912. Um, and now we get to 2017. Here you can see those final 2017 numbers. And the black bar is going to show us the highest ever uh, numbers of that infectious disease. So you can see what kind of decrease happened with that vaccine. And what I hope you noticed in every case was the way <laughs> I, I had no idea what that one is. <laughs> okay. Well, um, <laughs> sounds good. Sure. <laughs> um, um, what I hope that you also saw in that video was the way that basically once we introduced vaccines against different infectious diseases, they just sort of went away so quickly. Um, and so that shows you this pretty massive success of vaccines, not just kind of the positives of the Jenner uh, smallpox vaccine in general. Um, and if we actually also look at this in terms of economics, um, we uh, know that vaccines have had a pretty massive impact um, if you actually think about every dollar invested in vaccines, uh, it comes back to save about $16 for us. So um, in terms of the return we get on our investment, this is uh, really lar the largest kind of general health and general society uh, thing that we can invest in. Um, and if you think about the number of lives saved, you can think about, you know, that in, in a economic sense is pretty great. But then you also add on how many people were able to go to work and not take days off, or who, how many people didn't need hospital care, or you know, all of those kind of things, and you can get to some pretty massive numbers of um, how much money vaccines have helped us save. If you then add onto it things like agricultural vaccines and how much uh, we've done in terms of livestock and how that's helped with farming, um, vaccines are pretty clearly the uh, sort of uh, most, impactful economically uh, innovation that we have met, uh, in terms of medicine um, in general. So vaccines are uh, pretty useful. Um, and vaccines are all based on our understanding of a secondary immune response. So you have seen this before, where I've shown you the primary. Secondary immune responses are fantastic. Um, both in terms of magnitude and quality. They are bigger, faster, stronger, um, and are able to um, reduce um, replication of our microbe. The downside here is in order to get a secondary response, you have to have a primary response, which means you have to live through that primary response. And as you saw from the Bira paper, um, there is always some fraction that do not live through infection, or in that case, co-housing. There was a, a fraction that died. Um, and so you've got some risk in going through this primary response before you can get to this awesome secondary response situation. 
the general idea with the vaccine is that we are giving you some kind of preparation, and we'll talk more about what that preparation is, um, in order to uh, induce a primary response. And we're doing this in a way that is safe and does not have that risk of um, death. Um, so that if you ever are really infected, you can make a secondary response um, to that infection and get all the benefits of the secondary response without the risk associated with a previous primary response. Um, there are many vaccines available, some of which are shown here. Um, some of them are given uh, all the time. Um, some of them are actually very rare. Um, so I mentioned before, uh, you know, we have a smallpox vaccine. The smallpox vaccine is really only given at this point if you are working in laboratories um, with certain pox viruses. Um, there are some situations where people in the military get it as well. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, my smallpox vaccine experience um, a little bit later. Um, there are also some that are given, you know, very frequently, like the hep B vaccine or the flu vaccine or measles, mumps, and things like that. Um, and we have a uh, recommended immunization schedule, both for children and for adults. Um, this does not include all of the vaccines that I showed you on the previous slide. This includes only those that um, are things that are actual risk for uh, people in the population. Um, so for example, we don't give the yellow fever vaccine here because we don't have yellow fever um, circulating in the United States. Um, so if you were traveling somewhere where yellow fever is circulating, you might have to get a yellow fever vaccine, but it's not part of the recommended childhood immunization schedule in the US. Um, because it is not something that we're um, really worried about. And so these are, um, this is sort of the 2017 um, CDC recommendations. Um, they have changed a little bit. You can see that um, many of them start uh, in sort of this two to six month um, age uh, period. By and large, um, they're all usually given in a three dose series. Um, and so you generally get three shots of most of these. Um, I actually had some conversations with a, a pretty prominent immunologist uh, earlier this year who was trying to argue um, that there is something qualitatively different when you see something a third time um, in the immune response. Um, and ever since then, I've been trying to track down um, some data on that to fully understand it. Um, because that, of course, would have important implications on things like COVID vac vaccine boosters <laughs> um, and seeing the, th the antigen for the third time. So I've actually been trying to track down those data. Um, it's not super clear, but it is actually noteworthy that pretty much every other vaccine we have does is a three-shot series. Um, in general, you can see that, yes, we are giving a whole bunch of vaccines kind of at, a similar, at some similar times for kids. Um, we've made this schedule for a very specific reason. The idea with this timing is that we're trying to wait until maternal antibodies that have come through the placenta have waned. So mom's antibodies are not going to neutralize the vaccine. We want to make sure that the baby's immune system is going to actually get a chance to respond. We don't want mom's immune system doing mom's antibodies doing the response. So we've got to wait long enough that the baby's going to be ready to make that response. Some of that is about maturation, but a lot of it is about having mom's antibodies degrade. But we also want to immunize that baby really early so that we can get them protection really early. So for example, pertussis is pretty lethal in infants. You don't want to have your baby sitting around susceptible to pertussis for any longer than you need to. And so the idea here is that we're trying to get those babies immunized as quickly as possible um, as soon as their immune system is ready for it. Um, there, and so that's really the reasoning behind a lot of this scheduling. Um, there are uh, there's sort of one other 
practical piece to that. Um, this partially, at least in my mind, comes up when I think about hepatitis B vaccines. Um, and the reason why this comes up to me when I think about hepatitis B vaccines is I did not get my hepatitis B vaccines at birth one to two months and around a year. Um, I got my hepatitis B vaccines when I was getting ready to go to college. Um, and again, it's a three dose series. Um, and when I was in graduate school, um, we were, we were in, I was in a vaccine development lab. Um, we were talking about vaccine, various vaccine issues all the time. And at one point we were being kind of negative about, can you believe those people are not getting their second shot? Like, cause our boss was talking about, you know, needing to make certain vaccines be like a one shot vaccine. And we're like, that's ridiculous. People need to be able to go get second shots and people need to be like, that's so wrong. And he's like, whoa, 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 guys. You are all vaccine developers. Raise your hand if you got the first hep B shot. Pretty much everybody in the room raised their hand. Raise your hand if you managed to get the second hep B shot. Not everyone in the room raised their hands. Raise your hand if you got the third hep B shot. Even fewer people raised their hands. There is sort of this other healthcare issue of compliance and patient follow-up and getting people to come back. One of the other reasons why so many of these are happening at the same time is because we want the parent to come and immunize their child that day. We don't want to make them come once a week for like three months because then we're more likely to lose them. We want to, we, we have them coming to the pediatrician's appointment. We don't want to make them come back a bunch of times. We want to give them those vaccines. Their baby's immune system is ready. We're going to give them those vaccines so that we can make sure they're getting vaccinated. The concern that many parents have is they worry about, well, what if that's too many antigens? They don't usually use the word antigen, but they're, they're really saying, what if that's too many antigens for my baby to have in one day? Is, that a, is it gonna be a problem? Um, right now I'm standing under an air vent that is blowing air on me. I am experiencing far more antigens right now than one would um, from that. Um, you experience generally millions of antigens in a day, a million plus 10 and a million are not different. Um, and so your immune system is more than capable <laughs> of dealing with all of this. Um, so this is sort of what that uh, generally looks like. Um, when we are making vaccines, there are a few things that we think about. Um, historically, this was done by trial and error. Um, and the basic way that you, one would do this is um, one would find some people who um, had survived whatever infectious disease you were interested in, see what kind of immune response they made, and then figure out how to copy it. And this is because it turns out that, and this may be news to some members of the media right now, you don't need just any old kind of immune response from a vaccine. Immune response is kind of vague, as you've kind of seen over this whole semester. There's a lot of details of that. It's not just about do you get an immune response or not. Um, you need to have, make sure that that uh, vaccine is inducing the right kind of response. So. Maybe you need to induce neutralizing antibodies and not antibodies in general. Maybe you need to induce CD8 T cell memory or something like that. And so you need to have this question of what kind of immune response are you going to make um, and how are you going to make it? And so one of the first things you usually are doing when you're thinking about these vaccines is thinking about what kind of immune responses you might want. Um, in some cases, that's really sort of pretty straightforward because we can just look at survivors. In other cases, we don't have examples of survivors to understand um, what's going on with their immune responses. Um, and we have to 
uh, do some other types of experiments. And so what we try to look for in these types of experiments are something known as the correlates of immune protection. Um, and so with every, any vaccine, first of all, you need to know what is the correlate of immune protection or what is the kind of immune response you're going for and can you make enough of it with your vaccine? Um, some of the correlates of immune protection for different types of microbes are shown on the left. Um, so you can see that, for example, with uh, the chickenpox uh, virus, um, making IgG and IgM as well as CD8 cells is really important. Whereas for others, um, like influenza, making IgA might be more important. And so those types of things might be the correlates. Um, if you look in um, the literature and sort of papers that have, are coming out, and in fact, papers that have come out within the past month or so, um, one of the big sort of things that's been going on in the literature right now are papers coming out trying to talk about the correlates of immune protection with the COVID vaccines. And specifically what they're trying to look at are all the immune responses that people are making and which ones seem to protect you from breakthrough infections more so than others. And so there have been multiple big correlates papers that have come out in the past month about COVID vaccines. Um, there are other situations where we have to try to figure out the correlates um, when we don't actually have survivors. So one great example of this is HIV. We don't really know of people who have been infected and then not gotten HIV and AIDS. And as a result, we have to do more statistical types of measures um, to try to figure out uh, ways that we can find things that actually statistically correlate um, with better outcome. Though, as you can see here, I may be somewhat biased on the importance of all of this. Um, there's one other thing to be aware of as far as um, correlates of immune protection. And that is that we sometimes realize that what your immune system actually does when you're infected is off is often great. But sometimes other kinds of immune responses could protect you too. So just because it's the one you usually make or just because it's kind of the one we often think of doesn't mean it's always sort of the best case sort of situation. The other thing that's going to come up on the next slide, and this is going to come up again later as well, is that whenever we are thinking about a lot of these vaccine situations, we also have to think about the goal. And in most cases, the goal is going to be making sure you don't have disease or particularly making sure you don't have severe disease. And again, this will come up later on. Um, and so just to give you one kind of example of the idea that this is sometimes a little bit trickier than um, one might expect, I want to mention something briefly about one of the two uh, types of polio vaccines. Um, so this is one of our types of polio vaccines, um, IPV, which is the inactivated polio vaccine. Um, but before I tell you about the IPV, I want to tell you um, some, you know, really in-depth virology of the polio virus. Polio virus um, is a virus that you acquire through contaminated food and water. So you actually get polio um, by ingestion of polio virus. And what you can imagine is that then when that, you've ingested that virus, it's going to come into contact with mucosal surfaces in your GI tract, like in your intestine. And it uh, then is going to lead to some uh, infection and a replication in your intestine. It's gonna be shed in the feces to potentially infect another person. When you think about polio, there's a particular disease and a particular body system that you think of. So when you think of polio, what do you think of in terms of body system or disease? Hmm? Okay. 
You, you think about the lungs, we can think about why the lungs. What actually happens to a person with polio? What's like the big thing? Yeah. They become paralyzed. There's something going on with the nervous system. The problem with the lungs is they actually become paralyzed and to the point where they can't breathe well. <laughs> um, and so when people think about polio, they think about the nervous system and paralysis. Well, from the basics I just told you, polio is infecting your intestine, which is not your nervous system. See, I know the, the big anatomy. Your intestine is not your nervous system. Um, however, a small fraction of this virus um, can actually um, make its way into the blood from the intestine and eventually go into neurons to lead to paralysis. Um, it is a very small fraction. Um, my brain wants to say 1%, but I have no evidence supporting that right now. Um, the uh, inactivated polio vaccine induces some antibodies, but those antibodies don't necessarily do what you think. The antibodies induced by the inactivated polio vaccine actually act here and make it so that the virus cannot leave the intestine. And so the virus can still infect you, can still reproduce in your intestine, can still be spread to others, but it cannot leave your intestine to go to your nervous system. Um, and that's how this vaccine of the two polio vaccines actually protects you from polio is it doesn't let the part of the infection that leads to disease happen. Um, it just lets the virus kind of potentially replicate within you. Um, polio eradication, um, the, the fact that we have two polio vaccines, the way we use the two of them and how that works is a little more complicated than I'm getting into right now. But what you should notice, what I want you to notice is these immune responses are not necessarily going to be the ones that completely protect you from infection. By and large, we're looking at immune responses that are going to protect you from disease. And this is a, a big example of that. Um, on that sort of same kind of front, um, you know, realize, yeah, we generally think that with that secondary response, you could get infected again. It's just that you're not getting disease because you're not allowing the microbe to replicate long enough um, to actually cause disease. Why do I make a big deal about this? Why have I changed um, the way I present this information um, in the past couple of times I've presented it compared to past years? Yeah. Um, people are getting, who are vaccinated are getting tested for COVID so often still that they're oftentimes thinking that they're getting, like they're saying, oh, I got COVID even though I'm vaccinated, even though they're not having like severe symptoms or disease days. Yeah, you're hearing a lot about breakthrough infections right now. Oh my gosh, vaccinated people are getting infected. Yeah, big deal, no surprise. You could imagine with our polio example, this person could still get polio. If you decided that you were going to do PCRs of samples from this person's GI tract, you might find polio. But if you asked them, did you get polio virus? They'd be like, oh no. See, look how not paralyzed I am, right? That's right. Yet the virus could potentially still be there. If you think about many of the vaccines you've received in your life, you have not then also had lots of super sensitive PCRs to see if that virus got into your body. You've just ch checked to see if you got sick and been happy because you didn't. And so in general with vaccines, we are really thinking about trying to protect you from disease. Um, and, you know, we can see that here. If we were, we could imagine a situation where we had a vaccine that neutralized this virus. And that would completely protect us from an infection. That's a really high bar. That means you're saying that if I breathe in virus, 
it can't get into one cell. That's what it would mean to protect against infection. That is a crazy high bar. Alternatively, we might say, well, what I should have is I want to have an immune response that's going to stop that virus really fast. So I get infected, but the immune system stops the virus really quickly, sort of like a fire extinguisher. So you got it around, so as soon as any little bit of infection starts, you can put it out. And that's kind of what you might think about as what that vaccine might be doing. You could also imagine that that vaccine could potentially block your ability to transmit. Um, particularly if, say, it is making the uh, virus reproduce at a lower level, you're probably less likely to transmit. You may not be 0% likely to transmit, but you're going to be less likely to transmit. And if we have decreases kind of at every step of the transmission cycle, then eventually we get to zero, which hopefully you saw in our simulation that we did before. And um, this is actually specifically what we were looking at with the um, COVID vaccine. So these are actually the data um, from the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Um, so here you can actually see people who got um, placebo in blue, people who got the vaccine in red. Um, and this is looking at days after their first dose and whether or not they got COVID. And they actually have a very specific definition of what they call getting COVID. You had to have two symptoms. Um, and you can also see a blow up of just these first few days up there so you can see it in more detail. And so this is actually what that looks like. Note that they were not looking to see whether or not people got infected. They were looking to see whether or not people got disease, which they counted as having two symptoms. Um, these are the data that were used to show that this vaccine was 95% efficacious. Um, and so we can also see how they made that determination here. So in their placebo group, They had um, 21,686 people. In their vaccine group, they had 21,669 people. And in their placebo group, 172 got COVID. In their vaccine group, nine got COVID. That's how, and then you can take those data and do some additional calculations on them. You can actually calculate incidence in the unvaccinated minus incidence in the vaccinated. Hey, you do this <laughs> um, with those numbers, and that gets you to that 95% efficacy that Pfizer was reporting. So what I want you to realize from this, from these data is that nobody ever said you're not going to get COVID. There are nine out of 21,000 people who got COVID, even though they got vaccinated in this trial. You can also see it's not like it, it's saying there's a 5% chance here or something. Um, the 95% is actually sort of a, a very calculated value. It's not telling you anything about your actual percentage chance of getting sick. Um, you can see their actual numbers of how many got sick in the placebo group, how many got sick in the vaccine group um, here. So this is sort of what we're looking for for um, effect of vaccines. Um, one thing that also just generally makes me want to chuckle sometimes when I look at these kinds of data um, Way back, early, very early in the pandemic, um, when the vaccines were starting, the FDA actually wrote, down, wrote out and published what their rules were going to be for approving a vaccine. And the FDA's rule was they were going to approve a vaccine and we were going to be happy and joyous if that vaccine was at least 50% efficacious. We got a vaccine that's 
95% efficacious on the first try. And some people are like, oh, I don't know. It's just not good enough for me. Seriously. <laughs> um, so that's one thing whenever I look at these data, I'm like, really, guys? We like hit a home run, and you still think it's not good enough. Come on. Um, <laughs> When we are making vaccines, we also um, have a few other things that we're going to think about. Um, I'm going to come back to the uh, one at the top in a second. Uh, one of those things is that we need to make sure that we are inducing protective immunity in the population. Um, and so that comes into, um, will this um, vaccine induce immunity in everyone? Um, is it going to give up, which antigen is important? Is that antigen going to be useful for everyone, depending on their MHC type? Um, are we trying to make T cells? Are we trying to make B cells? Um, are we trying to make neutralizing antibodies, IgA versus IgG, all of that kind of stuff. So we need to think about which type of immunity we want to make, which antigen we want that immune response to, to happen against. Some of that actually comes in with how we decide to um, deliver the immunization. Do we want to um, do an intramuscular vaccine into a muscle, subcutaneous, under the skin, um, intradermal, um, actually sort of within the skin, um, oral, things like that. People prefer oral, but there's that whole oral tolerance problem. Normally want to make give you tolerance to the microbe. That would be even worse than um, not having the vaccine at all. Um, we know that intramusculars tend to give a very good um, response. They also tend to give a somewhat more Th1 biased response, which is good, particularly for a lot of viruses. Um, and so trying to figure out kind of the root of immunization that will give us that ideal response is also pretty important. Um, we want that protection to be long lasting. Um, by and large, the a uh, way that we deal with that is we wait and see how long lasting that protection is. Um, one thing that we are learning more and more recently is that some of the protection that we used to think was, was long lasting is actually not quite as long as we used to think. Um, there are some vaccines that we are starting to think about giving additional sh boosters on. Um, for example, there is a lot of talk about whether um, an additional mumps booster needs to be given to people in their 20s. Um, because we realize the mumps protection doesn't last as long as we originally thought. Um, we want the vaccine to be low cost. The WHO prefers that vaccines cost less than a dollar per dose. Um, we want that vaccine to be genetically stable. Um, would be bad if we put a vaccine in people and then it mutated um, to potentially cause issues. We want that vaccine to um, be stored um, at consider in methods that work pretty well. You may have heard about minus 80 freezers and the potential issues with minus 80 freezers um, in uh, some of the COVID vaccines. Um, I remember joking at one time, because we have a minus 80 freezer that we use for research. And I was like, does like this, does like Madison need our minus 80 to like store the vaccine? And if so, does that mean I can have a dose first? <laughs> um, but this is a bigger problem if you are trying to take a vaccine around the world um, and you have to think about, is there reliable electricity around the world? Can you power that minus 80 freeze? Can you keep that vaccine at minus 80 from your company's building all the way until you're getting ready to inject into a person? Is there gonna be enough electricity to do that? Um, or things like this, this is known as the cold chain problem. Um, and so those sort of details become really important how are you going to deliver it, oral, needle, all those kind of things. Um, for example, it turns out that we had to worry about how we were going to mass produce syringes um, in the past couple of years because of the needs that we were gonna have for vaccine deployment. Um, the other piece of this is that you want your vaccine to be safe. Um, so you don't want it to cause disease and you also want it to have minimal side effects. This one is, uh, sort of a, an interesting point of debate because it says we want it to cause minimal side effects. Well, what does minimal mean? Does minimal mean the same thing to every person? 
So if you think about many vaccines, many vaccines cause things like a little bit of a fever, aches, things like that, being tired. Why is it that vaccines are often going to cause fevers, aches, fatigue? Why might that happen? Yeah, Jamie. You're having an immune response. Any specific aspects of that immune response that are related here? Yeah. This is the innate immune response. This is interferon doing its job. So what you can think about is at some level, if you make a vaccine that gives you absolutely no, none of those side effects in any of your people, are you making an appropriate innate immune response? If your goal is to make an immune response, at least some fraction of the population is going to ha get to the point of having those side effects. And so how do you design a vaccine that has none of those um, yet still gives you a good immune response? And so sort of figuring out this balance is tricky. Um, and you have to, in, in different cases, sort of what you consider good or bad side effects may vary compared to what is the disease you're trying to protect against and what is the likelihood of that disease actually happening. Um, and so this is a, is a big place where we see a lot of kind of debate and, and trade-off. Um, I mentioned the side effects um, being innate immune responses. Um, there's a question that often comes up at this point, so I will just head it off now, which is that uh, someone actually has done in 2021, they did a study on healthcare workers who had different levels of side effects. Um, and checked their antibody and T cell levels to see if it was it, if you didn't have side effects, if it meant that you didn't make an immune response, and all the immune responses were fine with or without the side effects. So um, the idea is that we're having trouble making a vaccine that gives you no side effects across the population. But if you personally did not have side effects, that does not mean that your uh, immune response is bad. And again, that actually was checked this year. Um, the other thing I will tell you is that um, by and large, um, in every vaccine that we know of, uh, any, long, any side effect that lasted for a long time, so any side effect that happened was a long-term side effect, um, first presented in the patients within two weeks. And so, um, we know if there are going to be any issues within the first two weeks after vaccination. Um, there is something called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System where people can report. However, that reporting system is where people are just saying this bad thing happened to me after vaccines. It doesn't have a control group. It doesn't have a list of people who just write bad things that happened to them when they didn't get vaccinated. Um, and so you can look at it and you can see this number of people died within a year after getting vaccines. You can actually also calculate based on population numbers how many people should die in a year in a group that size. And you actually, it's actually, I think it's, it actually ends up being less. I don't remember the numbers now. Again, I have numbers in my head, but I don't think they're right. But for example, these are the numbers that are in my head. They're probably not right. Do not quote me on them and like, right to the New York Times. Um, but it was something like 14,000 people should have died given how many people we gave a vaccine to in a year just and how many people die in the population and 12,000 who got the vaccine died. Like it, it's something like that. So yes, in fact, 12,000 people who got the vaccine did die because some people die every year. Um, and so that's the trick with the vaccine adverse events reporting system is that it's basically people are like, my toe hurts and I got a vaccine, so it must be related. And it does not actually have any control for how many people's toes hurt just because they were living life. Um, in the pediatric trial of the COVID vaccine, there were actually five adverse events reported, um, one of which was that a kid swallowed a penny <laughs> in the vaccine group. So anytime you look at those data, take them with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, so this is kind of what people think about when they're thinking of um, vaccines uh, helping to protect us against disease, is they're thinking about how this works 
using a memory response and using a secondary response. And that is absolutely true, of course. Um, and that's really thought about as the individual impact of an immune response. That's thinking about, I got a vaccine because I don't want to get COVID. Because I think long COVID sounds scary. Um, and so that's what we often think about when we're getting vaccines. But in fact, vaccines really work in two ways. Um, so we have vaccines that are working um, to mobilize the host immune system to prevent infection and taking advantage of memory. But at the same time, those vaccines are also working by population level effects. Um, and that, those population level effects are that they are uh, breaking uh, the transmission cycle of host-host spread. So stopping the possibility of an epidemic amongst our population. So what that means is that by me getting vaccinated, you are all less likely to get COVID because you're now not going to have a person with COVID lecturing COVID at you. Um, and so you are all protected by my vaccine as well, is sort of the idea here. Um, this is known as herd immunity. Um, and it really is um, something that requires a particular level of immune responses in the population. And so the percent of people in a population who are vaccinated or who are protected are really important uh, for herd immunity to work out. And so um, here you can see that I think that um, honestly, the idea of spread of a communicable disease, pretty well understood by the population at this point and here as well. Um, so I want to show you two examples of how herd immunity can change with the percent vaccinated. Who knows what YouTube will decide to show us this time? Um, so this one is a bit more general. Uh, yeah, I don't want the ad. Uh, sorry. I know. I'm trying to save children with vaccines. <laughs> um, so in these uh, situations, we are, we're looking at uh, six different populations here. And in those six different populations, we have different percentages of people who are vulnerable. So here there's 100% vulnerable. You could also say that that is 0% vaccinated. Um, and those percents are actually at the top. Um, so 75% vulnerable, 25% vaccinated, 50, 50, you can do that math. And um, the uh, number of people who are infected is going to be shown in red. Um, the number who are not are going to be shown in green. And so we can see this going here. So what you should notice here is that this effect isn't totally linear. When most people, where everyone was susceptible, pretty much everybody got infected. When a few people were uh, vaccinated, that was great for them, but didn't really do much for the population. Same with 50-50. But once we got to this point where 75 were vaccinated, we really made a difference population-wise as well um, and protected a lot of people here that would not have been protected otherwise. And so you can see this population level effect of the vaccines here as well. This here, you can see that, um, you know, that threshold is, you know, around 75%. Um, as the video is saying, um, the exact percentage varies based on how transmissible the microbe is. So things that sp are spread more easily need more people to be vaccinated. Things that spread less easily need fewer people to be vaccinated. 
Um, I also want to show you this in another way. which is this one. So this is going to be specific to measles. Um, and um, measles is the most transmissible virus we know of. So it's the one that needs the highest percentage of people vaccinated for herd immunity. The thing that I really like about this one is you can actually make it uh, local. It uses real population data. Um, about things like population density um, and other parameters to do this correctly. So um, this is showing us Essex County, New Jersey. Um, Drew would be right over here in the county next to it. This is the closest we can, can get <laughs> to here. Um, and we're going to watch measles spread through this population. Um, on the left, we're first going to watch it when there are 80% of people vaccinated against measles. And so that is actually below the threshold needed to stop a measles epidemic. Um, and you can see covered is 80%. Um, you're gonna see days at the top. These two simulations are actually gonna show the same number of days. So here is our 80% simulation. Oh, that's the wrong button. Stop. Is it this one? Yeah, that one. Okay. Here we go. And again, this is 80% coverage with measles vaccine. So you can see what 238 days of a measles epidemic in this area based on population density around here would look like. Um, not great. And this is when we're below that threshold. Now we're going to see the same thing at 95% coverage, where we are above the threshold. We are going to see 238 days again, which was how long the previous one lasted. So that's what it looks like uh, with when we actually are above that herd immunity threshold percentage um, compared to what you see on the left, where we're at 80%, which is below that threshold. And so what I hope you see here is the uh, pretty dramatic effect that herd immunity can have, um, where it's not just about having you vaccinated. That's great for you. But if we're getting vaccinated as a population, you can really help out members of the population. Um, so the idea here is that um, spread really stops when the probability of infection is below a particular threshold. Um, that threshold is specific to the virus as well as uh, based on some other details of a population. Um, but you also need to realize that no vaccine is 100% effective. Some people are going to get vaccinated and not make a good immune response. There are also some people who cannot get vaccinated either because of um, different types of immunodeficiencies or other types of disease states. Um, and so, for example, with measles, we need about 95% of people to be vaccinated. So you can be like, oh, sweet, there's 5% that don't have to be. I'm going to be one of the 5% because I don't feel like it. Just know that that 5% also includes all the people who's vac who got vaccinated and the vaccine didn't work and all the people who couldn't get vaccinated. Um, and we don't really have a lot of room for error there. And so by all of us getting vaccinated, we can really help to make sure we're keeping that percentage high. 
And so you can see, for example, if you uh, immunize 80% of the population with measles, only 76% are actually going to have a response. So we really don't have room for error on this one. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk about vaccine types um, and a little bit about how we are making different types of vaccines. Um, and I will admit, um, looking at my timing left, I'm really going to be hitting the highlights here. <laughs> um, so we can think about making vaccines in a bunch of different ways. This is what kind of preparation we're giving you to give you that primary response. So one big type of uh, vaccine that's out there is the live attenuated vaccine. So this is a situation where we are using a version of the microbe that is able to reproduce, but that is weakened. Um, so it's a live but weakened form of the pathogen, which means that that pathogen can still replicate and induce an, uh, a full immune response. This means that your body is seeing kind of all potential forms of the pathogen um, that may be needed. Um, and we are getting uh, some replication. It actually means that the dose you put in amplifies because it will, will reproduce. Um, we've got lots of live attenuated vaccines that are used. These are amazing because they give the strongest immune responses. Um, they are problematic because they're really difficult to store since the microbe is still alive. They also have the potential to mutate. And if you give them to an immunocompromised person, you may still get some disease. In fact, you may get disease from the, you may sometimes get a little bit of disease from these. So these are in some cases the least safe, but the ones that give the strongest immune response. Um, they also, like I said, are, can be really difficult in terms of storage and their ability to mutate. Um, in the past, the way we made them is we would actually just put a microbe in culture and wait until it happens to weaken by random evolution. In the case of the tuberculosis vaccine, they had to wait 28 years. Um, now we actually use molecular biology and remove genes for virulence or mutate them. Um, we also have inactivated vaccines. Um, so with an inactivated vaccine, we are vaccinating with a killed form of the pathogen. Um, and we are going to have the pathogen actually replicate, or not replicate, but we're still gonna have antigens. Um, so this is gonna be much safer because we don't have replication, but it's also gonna have the downside of not actually reproducing in cells and not showing this, the body all of the potential antigens. Um, so they're way safer, they're way easier to store, um, but they don't give you as much of an immune response. Um, in a, and so that's kind of the, the main piece that I wanna say about inactivated. Um, with all of the other types of vaccines, they all have something else in common. With all of the other types of vaccines that are out there, we're not using the full microbe. Instead, with all of the other types of vaccines, we are taking an antigen of interest and just delivering that antigen of interest. We can deliver it in different forms, but we're just taking the thing that we know is the antigen and delivering that. And you can imagine, in every case, that's gonna be safer than giving a full microbe. Um, even in many cases, you're taking that antigen and you're making it in the lab. So you never even had to have the microbe in your lab in the first place in order to make that antigen. Um, there are different forms of the antigen that we can use. Um, one of them is a protein. And so you can use, you can say, ah, spike is the right antigen. I'm going to inject people with spike. If you do that, that is known as a subunit vaccine. I'm just gonna come right ahead. And so here you're usually gonna be taking that uh, viral gene um, and actually just making the protein and injecting the protein into people. Um, again, you can imagine that that is super safe. This is how um, the hepatitis B and HPV vaccines are done. Also, if you've heard of the Novavax, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, it is also a subunit. Um, we can also 
um, do things where we might take the gene encoding the antigen and inject the nu that nucleic acid, either in the form of mRNA that is coded in a lipid or in terms of DNA, um, which may be put inside some other virus. Um, in either case, we're trying to uh, deliver that nucleic acid. Um, and the big, one of the big pros here is that in both of those cases, you're translating the protein inside of cells, particularly in the cytoplasm of cells. When you translate the protein in the cytoplasm, it is able to get onto MHC plus one really easily. And so you can get a good T cell response. So you, because the protein is coming from inside the cell, you're able to stimulate a better T cell response than you would be able to do if the protein was outside of the cell. And so a subunit vaccine is largely going to give you um, antibodies while a nucleic acid vaccine is going to give you a lot of antibodies and T cells. And that's really a big pro of it. Um, the other problem that comes up is that um, particularly when we're looking at protein-based vaccines, though this is also true with inactivated, sometimes you do not get good PRR stimulation. You know, if you put in a purified protein, that's awesome. You got a thing to make some that your spike's going to uh, act, or your antibodies are going to act against spike, but you actually aren't going to turn on your immune response at all. You kind of need that to help make a good adaptive response. And so sometimes we also add these molecules into our vaccines called adjuvants um, that allow us to um, sort of turn on the adaptive immune or the innate immune system and give us a good innate response in addition to the adaptive response. But the adjuvants are tricky because that also might influence the side effect profile. And so you have to kind of figure out how do I get you a good innate response without giving you side effects. And that balance is something that uh, a lot of vaccine developers are trying hard to deal with. I will see you guys in lab tomorrow.